This is Matthew Cratter from Trade University, and today I want to answer the question, did Satoshi Nakamoto pre-mine Bitcoin? If you don't know what a pre-mine is, I'm going to explain that in a minute. But this whole video was inspired by a recent Pomp uh, tweet thread that you can read about. I'll link to below. Basically, a pre-mine, it's when you print up your own tokens, your own crypto, your own coins, your own money, whatever you want to call it, and then give them to yourself and your buddies and or insiders and VCs often get a very large allocation as well. So for example, with Solana, VCs got to buy Solana tokens at a very low price, just a few cents. We can see here that many projects suffer from uh, the dynamics that come from a pre-mine. Solana is one of the, the biggest uh, offenders of, uh, of them all right here. But obviously Terra, Phantom, Polkadot are all guilty as well. If you want to read more about Solana VCs and how they're planning to dump on you, you can check out this link in the description notes below. So why would a corporation or project want to issue tokens? Well, this is a way of paying for developers. It's also usually a way of paying for marketing. And whether this is done by some sort of centralized corporation or foundation, you have uh, groups like Ethereum that set up a foundation and did this stuff overseas, whether in Switzerland for uh, for Ethereum or Japan, for Cardano. There are ways of trying to get away around the, uh, the regulations. But either way, this is a way for a project, a very centralized project, to raise some money and then spend that on marketing. You can see Ripple's ads. I'll link to one of them below. They've also done promotions, for example, on the Ellen DeGeneres show, which just shows you what a centralized joke XRP and Ripple are. And uh, Aston Kutcher is the one who went on the... Uh, the Ellen Show and donated some XRP to her. Of course, he's an investor in Ripple through his own private investment fund, which people won't won't tell you about. So what, what's the big problem with pre-mines and big pre-sales? Isn't this what every startup does when you issue private, uh, private shares to initial angel investors and wealthy VCs? This is very different, and I think that it's it's not uh, it's not wise or accurate to conflate the two because in one case you're actually issuing equity, private shares, or ownership in a centralized corporation, usually a Delaware corporation. But then you're not required to use those shares to use the product. It's very diff it's very different. So Ethereum, you need Ether to pay the gas fees. But when you use the Facebook network, you don't use Facebook shares as gas to um, to use to use the Facebook network. So it's a very it's a very bad analogy, and um, the real problem is this: you cannot create a neutral, global, decentralized money when you have a pre-mine. Having a pre-mine destroys neutrality. In addition, there's nothing decentralized about having a central group of people issue a currency, print it up ahead of ahead of time, and then try to sell it to people. The problem with this sort of concentration as well, the concentration that comes from a pre-mine, is it ruins the incentives. And this is what's happened with Ethereum. You had something like 60, 70 percent of Ethereum was a pre-mine or pre-sale. And now there's this incentive for them to move to proof of stake, which means that the largest holders of Ethereum can just sit on their hands and continue to get rich. By contrast, if you want to mine Bitcoin, you have to spend money on Bitcoin miners. These depreciate. It's a real arms race. It's a very competitive industrial process. And you might mess up. Whereas if you're a large holder of Ethereum, there's no way to mess up. You just sit, uh, you just stake your coins and you continue to get richer. So this is an example where a pre-mine sets the course. The Ethereum pre-mine set the course to the transition to proof of stake. And they're hiding it under ESG, environmental um, energy concerns. But what's really going on here is they are finding a way to continue to control the network and enrich themselves. I'll link to this video if you want to learn more about Ethereum's dirty history. 62% of the current supply was pre-mined. It was distributed before the first ETH block was mined. This is very different from what, we see, what we're going to see with Bitcoin. And as I said, these people can then deposit their ETH under the new proof of stake system, earn even more ETH, and have more control over the network. Now let's look at Bitcoin and see how different it was. First of all, the Bitcoin white paper, which was the solution to the Byzantine generals problem, it was published on Halloween of 2008. Here's a copy of the paper. I'd encourage everyone to read it. It's actually 
not that difficult to read if you read it slowly, and it's only nine pages. So we first had the release of the Bitcoin white paper. Then we had, uh, a lot of people will tell you that the Genesis block was mined on January 3rd, 2009. This was the first block in the Bitcoin blockchain. I'm not sure this is exactly true. Please correct me if I've gotten it wrong. If you look at the Wikipedia article, it looks to me like this initial block was back backdated. And it did include a headline from a UK newspaper, The Times, talking about, talking about bank bailouts as sort of a timestamp or as a critique of the fiat financial system. But as far as I can tell, the Bitcoin software was released publicly on January 9th, 2009 by Satoshi. He released it on the website uh, Source Forge. Obviously, it's open source software. And then the Genesis block was sort of defined by the code at the same time. It wasn't really mined on January 3rd. It was brought into creation and backdated on January 9th. You can correct me if I've misunderstood something. This initial Genesis block did carry a minor reward or a subsidy reward of 50 Bitcoin. This 50 Bitcoin is currently worth about three or four million dollars at current prices. But it's important to note that this initial block, the Genesis block, block number zero, is not spendable. These 50 Bitcoin are not spendable. That was hard coded into the software. Now, as we said, the software was released to the world on January 9th. The first real block that's spendable, block number one, was actually mined using proof of work on January 9th, on the same day that the software was released. And so we had this situation where the, the white paper came out, there were a number of months that people had to read it, and then the software itself was released. After the software was released, Satoshi began to mine Bitcoin blocks, presumably on his own computer. And to do this, he had to burn electricity. He actually had to do the work. He had to run the proof of work algorithm. So why was he doing this? Was he doing this to accumulate those million Bitcoin? I don't think so. I don't think he was doing it for the money. He, the most obvious reason he was doing it is someone needed to provide security for the Bitcoin network. At that point, there was really only Satoshi. He was the only Bitcoin miner in the world. And so he was doing the work of securing the network by mining Bitcoin. It's very important to realize as well that Bitcoin did not even have a price or value at this point. When the Ethereum pre-mine and pre-sale happened, they asked everyone to exchange their Bitcoin for Ethereum. Ethereum actually had a real world price. When Satoshi was mining, when he did most of his mining, Bitcoin did not have any price, any market, any value. It didn't really have value as far as I remember until Laszlo bought two pizzas using, I think he paid 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas in May of 2010. At this point, uh, Bitcoin that you could calculate, you could sort of back into the value of Bitcoin. But when Satoshi was mining it, it did not have any uh, any real world or market value. You can read more about the Genesis block here, which I will link to. What's another thing that's very unique about the Genesis block that I failed to remember or mention is that it does not reference a previous block. Every other block after that always references a previous block, but the Genesis block obviously had no block to reference. We do know, or people uh, believe, I believe based on Hal Finney's own testimony that Hal Finney mined the 70th block of Bitcoin. So presumably Satoshi was doing most of the mining up until this point. Hal Finney mined the 70th block. He may have mined a few, a few more, but then he stopped because he said it was, it, was, it was overrunning his computer and it was annoying him, the computer fan. Uh, tragically, Hal Finney died just a couple years later. Now, people always ask, how do we know that Satoshi has never moved his coins? Well, the thing about the Bitcoin blockchain, it's an open ledger. Anyone can read it. You can explore it using what's called a blockchain explorer. And that's what I'm using here online. If you're running your own full node, you can also look this up as well. But I'm just going to use a public block explorer. This is block one. We can see that it was mined on January 8th, 2009 at 7.54 uh, p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. If we scroll down, we can see that the uh, the Coinbase, in other words, the the, um, the the minor subsidy, these newly generated coins were sent to a certain address here. We can see they're 50 Bitcoin. That used to be the minor subsidy or minor reward. 
and that's been halved many times. Since then, we're now down to 6.25 Bitcoin, but it was originally 50 Bitcoin, and it, these Bitcoin were sent to this address. We can use a, a, a service called OXT, which is sort of a chain analysis free service that allows you to look up various addresses. So what I did is I just copied this Bitcoin address. I'm putting it in this Explorer. I'm going to click search. And this will tell us uh, when the block was first seen. It was first seen on January 9th, 2009. It last saw some activity on October 9th of 2021. We can see here that it has more than 50 Bitcoin in it. This is because anyone can send Bitcoin to this address. People have done this to honor Satoshi. So it has a little bit more than uh, the 50 original Bitcoin. If we take a look at the activity, we can see that there is the, the Bitcoin has never left this address, the, the sort of the, the aqua turquoise line down here. The purple lines are transactions entering uh, entering that address. So this this Bitcoin has never been spent. It's just been left there. We can do the same for block number two, which was mined January 8th, 2009 at 7.55 p.m. We can scroll down here, copy the address, go to OXT, click search, and we'll see that this one also has 50 Bitcoin plus a little bit more. People have sent some Bitcoin to this address. And again, there have been no outgoing transactions. This is how we know that Satoshi has not moved his coins. If he did move his coins from this address, he, she, or they, we would uh, we would be able to see it on the blockchain. And so this is how we know you can go through all these early blocks. You can add up the number of coins. And this is how we estimate that Satoshi has something like a million Bitcoin. So did Satoshi do a pre-mine? No, he did he was the first miner, but he never set aside a huge pile of coins for himself at the beginning before he started mining. He never pre-mined them. He actually mined them in real time, burning real electricity, doing the work after releasing the software to the world on January 9th. And then most importantly, he's never sold any coins. He's never moved them. He's, he did a test transaction at Hal Finney. That's the only time he's ever moved any coins. He's never sold them to pay for marketing or to set up a foundation. And this is why Bitcoin is so neutral. It's a once in history event. It cannot be recreated because people understand how this works now. And so if you issue your own coin, it's really done in a cynical way. And um, this, this is what, what we mean by when we say that digital scarcity can never be repeated. If you do it again, you're just copying this and, uh, and there, will be, there will be a pre-mine. Bitcoin was not issued by a corporation or foundation and then dumped on people, on retail investors, mostly to pay for the currency's marketing budget. By contrast, we can look at people like Vitalik Buterin, who's been very critical of Bitcoin and thinks he's holier than uh, Satoshi and Bitcoin. Of course, he's dumped 25% of his holdings. This is the great contrast between someone who did a big pre-mine, a 60-70% pre-mine, and then sold his coins to enrich himself, and someone like Satoshi, who did not do a pre-mine, he mined these coins, he's never sold or moved a, a single coin. Now you may say, well, it's not fair that so-and-so got his Bitcoin at a lower price than me. Satoshi got his Bitcoin at the lowest price. He didn't really pay, he just paid the electricity costs, obviously. But this is always something that trips people up. That being said, anyone could have bought Bitcoin for very low prices for a few. Uh, I had a chance to buy it in 2011 and I dismissed it. I could have paid about a dollar for it. Anyone could have bought Bitcoin using Mt. Gox from 2010 to 2014. Of course, Mt. Gox the, uh, ended up stealing people's Bitcoin. So the only way you would have been able to survive this is if you had bought the Bitcoin there and then moved it off the exchange. But there were ways to buy Bitcoin in the early days. There were ways to earn Bitcoin in the early days. You could have sold some pizzas to Laszlo, for example, and gotten 10,000 Bitcoin. But many of us heard about Bitcoin and dismissed it. You probably heard about Bitcoin a few years ago yourself and did nothing about it. But even if you had done something about it, people underestimate how difficult hodling is. It's incredibly difficult. I've only been hodling Bitcoin since really 2019, and there've been a lot of ups and downs. If you put any significant amount of money that means something to you in Bitcoin, you will suffer. Uh, you'll get very stressed when it goes up a lot because you'll say, I don't own enough. You'll get really stressed when it crashes as it's done many, many times since I started buying into Bitcoin. Hodling is very difficult. It looks quite easy until you try to do it yourself. So when you hear people like Pomp being disingenuous 
and trying to cast aspersions on Satoshi. I hope you'll understand this background. You'll also understand Pomp's background. He's a VC. He's incented to try to uh, try to question whether a, a pre-mine is really a bad thing or not. His money depends on this. And uh, as such, I don't think his tweet thread is, is the most uh, honest way of approaching it. And I don't think it's good for the Bitcoin ecosystem. I don't think he explained these things very well. And uh, Pomp, in his pursuit of wealth, is really beginning to prove himself to be an enemy of Bitcoin, in my opinion. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.